ABC News Live. That is the scene from Interstate 90 in South Dakota, where roughly 200 miles remain closed after drivers and passengers in more than 100 vehicles were rescued after being stranded on the highway after facing whiteout conditions. It's part of what's being called a once in a generation winter storm that's sweeping across the country, impacting some 200 million Americans across 45 states with blizzard warnings and the threat of blinding snow, high winds and life threatening cold. And it's creating travel chaos on the roads and at airports as millions of families try to head out for the holidays. We'll have coverage from across the country, plus tips from the points guy on how to navigate travel camp cancellations. Sam Bankman Freed, the disgraced founder of crypto exchange FTX, who lost billions from his company's collapse, is back in the U.S. after his extradition on criminal charges. But he's now free on bail after posting a record $250 million bond. We'll have the latest on his case and what comes next. New transcripts from the January 6th committee have been released. We'll tell you what they reveal about the alleged pressure campaign against one key witness. The American teacher detained in Russia for almost a year and released the same day as Brittany Griner speaks to ABC News about her harrowing ordeal in a penal colony. It feels like that my patriotism or my citizenship to my own country meant absolutely nothing. They might as well have just left me there. Plus the story of the faithful friend who campaigned tirelessly to get her released and how she finally got out. And does food really taste better when someone else makes it for you? There may be scientific proof that a sandwich made by someone else does in fact hit the taste buds differently. So we put the theory to the test. Stephanie likes your sandwiches because she doesn't have to put the effort into making the sandwich. It's just beautifully constructed, lovingly delivered. Good evening, I'm Stephanie Ramos in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with what's being called the nightmare before Christmas, a dangerous storm that has 200 million Americans under winter weather alerts across 45 states, just as the Christmas travel crush begins. The misery index is climbing with thousands of flights already canceled today and tomorrow due to weather and many rethinking whether they'll make it home for the holidays. Driving isn't much better. Take a look at this. Eight states are under blizzard alerts as snow falls from the Dakotas through Chicago all the way to Buffalo. There is zero visibility reported in some spots in South Dakota closed a 200 mile stretch of interstate. An Arctic blast has sent temperatures plunging. Denver reported a record 37 degree drop in just one hour. It could be the coldest Christmas in decades for many. Tonight, the system is moving east with heavy rain and high winds and concerns that the frigid air behind could trigger a flash freeze. We'll have some travel tips in a moment and the full holiday forecast with Rob. But first, we begin with ABC's Mola Lenghi in Colorado. The timing couldn't be worse. The Arctic blasts march across the country just as millions are packing the nation's airports, creating a cascading travel nightmare right before Christmas. It's pretty crazy, it is indeed. Among the millions passing through TSA checkpoints today, Yours truly. Currently hustling through San Francisco Airport where some terminals are more crowded than others. The United Terminal this morning, an absolute zoo. Hoping to catch my flight to Denver. Denver bound flights today have been among the most canceled and most delayed. Despite sitting on the tarmac for more than an hour, I was one of the lucky ones. Ellie Ross is stuck in Denver, trying to go from Billings to St. Louis, now stranded overnight. That's not bad enough. The airline lost her baggage. How has the process been to rebook and, and find a new flight? Right now, it's terrible. Why it's been awful, yeah. yeah. Um, haven't been able to talk to a real person. Um, long lines, waiting everywhere. From Boston to LaGuardia to Chicago's O'Hare, more than 2,000 flights canceled in and out of the U.S. today, and the day's not even over yet. And with the combination of airlines reducing flights and crushing holiday demand, flights are 95% full, making rebooking a challenge, if not impossible. Tired, stressed, 
hungry, just hopeless, honestly. Such a challenge for so many families. Mola Lenke joins us now from a very busy Denver airport. Mola, it's not just flights, though. Other forms of transportation are also being impacted by the storm. Well, that's right, Stephanie. You know, here at Denver International Airport, uh, more than a quarter of all inbound and outbound flights canceled today. Nationwide, more than 1,500 flights canceled tomorrow already. But you're right, it's not just uh, air travel, it is also bus service and train travel throughout the country as Greyhound and Amtrak already warning that there will be cancellations to their services throughout the holiday weekend, Stephanie. Wishing all those travelers some much needed luck. Thank you so much, Mola. And for more on what travelers can expect, I want to welcome back Clint Henderson, managing editor of The Points Guy. Hey there, Clint. So we've got about 3,000 flights already canceled today and tomorrow. It's being called the nightmare before Christmas. Could this year's holiday travel mess really live up to the hype? Absolutely. You know, last year, uh, when we didn't have such severe weather, things totally melted down around Christmas. So unfortunately, Mother Nature is not cooperating this year, and we do think it's going to be really bad. In fact, it already is bad. You're seeing places like Chicago uh, and parts of the Midwest dealing with whiteout conditions and freezing temperatures. And that just means, you know, every plane has to be de-iced if they're flying at all. You know, you've got ground stops in some locations. So we're expecting the ripple effects of this to go on for days, uh, hopefully not weeks like last year, but anything is possible right now with this weather. What a mess and the timing ah, oh, is so unfortunate, but it is that time of year. Now, anyone who has a plane ticket for the next couple of days, they want to know what do they do? What should they anticipate? What's your advice for them? So the first thing is knowledge is power. You have to be your own best advocate right now because uh, of the mess out there. So you should know where your flight is coming from. Uh, apps like Flight Radar 24 are among my favorite, but even the airline's own app you can use to track your incoming flights in many cases. So be aware of where your flight's coming from. Uh, that'll tell you whether or not it's even going to make it to your airport so you can get out on time. Uh, but you should have the app installed, as I mentioned, because if you have to cancel and get rebooked, you you can do that yourself within the app, but you should also be following the airline on social media so you can direct message them if things go wrong. Uh, if you see your flight is canceled, you're already at the airport, run to the customer service desk, get on the phone to the airline, get on the rebooking app, message them on social media, I'll use all the tools in your toolbox because remember, you're going to be competing with everyone else whose flight was just canceled to get on the next available flight. And the truth is, because there's so many flights canceled and the airlines have scaled back the number of flights, there's very high competition for fewer seats right now. So uh, getting rebooked is going to be a challenge. But remember, you can always also get rebooked on a competitor airline in situations like this. So you just have to really ask and be your own best advocate. That's some really good advice. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a line at the airport, at, at the, the airline's desk, trying to rebook, and then I call them at the same time and then get rebooked faster over the phone. So it's a really great tip. Now, a lot of airlines are offering waivers. What do people need to know about those and how they work? So waivers are amazing. So we've actually, at the PointsGuy, we've been able to send some people to their holiday destinations early. So we were telling people as early as last weekend to start rebooking their flights to try to avoid today and tomorrow. Uh, so when the airline issues a waiver, that means they're not going to charge you to reticket it. So not only have they ditched change fees altogether, but they're not going to make you pay for the higher price ticket, and they could potentially put you on another airline. What weather waivers do not do, however, is guarantee you a hotel room, uh, a meal voucher or transportation cost if you're stuck somewhere overnight. So you can always ask, but the airlines consider that an act of God and they're not obligated to help you out when it comes to being stranded. So I always have a backup plan. I always know what, what airports are available, especially if I'm transiting via a, an airport like Charlotte, I'll look to see what hotels might be there if I get stuck. Always have a backup plan. And if you can push your reservation, so instead of going home the day after Christmas, you might wanna give it a few days because I have a feeling it's gonna take the airlines a, a bit of time to sort of work through the mess of what we're seeing right now. Absolutely. And we're, we're, we've seen some images there of, of people at airports and it's busy. It can be really chaotic, especially when flights are getting canceled. What are your tips for, for beating some of those really long lines? 
So the first thing I do is tell people to, to make sure that you're getting to the airport three hours early. I love uh, TSA PreCheck and Clear. I have both. They've saved me so much time over the years. It's well worth the small investment. And some credit cards will pay you back for those fees. Uh, so that's worth it to me. Get to the airports three hours early. Uh, if you have elite status or you can use a lounge, that's always a really good idea. Uh, but really pack your patience right now because, you know, we're all stretched to the limit and the airlines and airports still are not fully hired uh, since the pandemic. So they're they're doing better, but still everyone's going to be a little bit short tempered right now. Pack your patience. I was waiting for someone to say that line this holiday season. Clint, you nailed it. Thank you so much. Really appreciate the tips. Happy holidays to you. Happy holidays. Let's hope it's not as bad as we think it's going to be. Absolutely. We'll see. Now to more on that major storm causing these travel woes. It's being called a once in a generation storm leading to the coldest Christmas in decades. ABC's Alex Perez has the latest from Chicago. Tonight, that brewing bomb cyclone turning highways into white knuckle whiteouts for drivers. Outright blizzard conditions in the Northern Plains. This was the view from a trooper's cruiser in Cheyenne, Wyoming overnight. Officials nearly everywhere urging drivers to stay off the roads. The front moving into the Chicago area late this afternoon. Feels like it's 25. That's nothing compared to what's coming. Look what's coming. Overnight, powerful snow squalls forcing motorists to a standstill on Interstate 25 outside Wellington, Colorado. And more than 100 people rescued from Interstate 90 just outside Rapid City, South Dakota, taken to shelter to wait out the storm. A 200-mile stretch of that highway shut down till at least Friday. In Wichita, a glaze of ice turned highways into skating rinks. The bone-chilling cold stretching all the way to the deep south. In Houston, officials checking on the homeless. Our Elwin Lopez in Atlanta, where they're bracing for the coldest Christmas since 1985. The governor here declaring a state of emergency ahead of that Arctic front. Crews will be laying down two layers of brine before that rain moves in. The biggest concern, flash freezing and black ice. The president briefed on the storm by FEMA officials today. Please take this storm extremely seriously. Absolutely brutal conditions there. Alex Perez joins us now from Chicago. Alex, what are conditions there right now? Yes, Stephanie, the conditions have been deteriorating all day. We are bracing for temperatures that will feel like 30 below zero tonight. You can see city crews have been busy salting streets trying to get ahead of the icy conditions. This will be the coldest Christmas in Chicago since the year 2000. Stephanie. All right, Alex, thanks so much. Go ahead and stay warm. All right, let's get to the man everyone has been waiting to hear from tonight. Rob Marciano is tracking that all-important holiday forecast. And so many are wondering, Rob, if they will be able to make it to their holiday destination. Rob, what, what can you tell us? I mean, travel is going to be tough all the way around us, Stephanie. The le leading edge of this cold air is where that cyclone is, and it's going to bomb out, as we like to say. It's entering that rapid intensification stage right now, and that'll expand the wind field uh, to where the point where we've got wind alerts now extend over 1,000 miles from the center of this thing, and there you see it on the map. A lot more red on the map, too. North Dakota to all the way to upstate New York. We've got blizzard warnings and high wind warnings have now been posted for parts of the northeast. I don't think it's so much the amount of snow that's going to fall, but the fact that it's going to be blowing sideways and it's going to be blinding at times from St. Louis up to Chicago. Certainly Michigan, I think it's going to get hit very hard. And there you see D.C. up through Pennsylvania. We're going to look at very heavy rain here over the next several hours. Not only rain across the I-95 corridor, but we'll see coastal flooding on top of urban flooding and winds that could exceed 50 or 60 miles per hour on the warm and cold side of this. So that means some trees will come down. There'll be some power outages. And where it doesn't snow, namely in the northeast, It'll flash freeze, meaning some of that rain that's left over on the roadways, the temperatures will drop so quickly, we'll see some icing uh, come Friday night into Saturday morning. Here are some of the numbers, and they are striking. This is bone chilling, <coughs> biting stuff. And in case, in some cases, like the, the south, like Dallas, this is uh, 
pipe bursting stuff. So I hope your home is prepared for it. And uh, Louisville minus 27 tomorrow morning. This does spread towards the East Coast and envel envelops uh, everybody from the Maine all the way towards uh, Florida. And Saturday morning lows will be similar. Places like Nashville and Pittsburgh where they're hosting NFL games. On top of everything else, some of these outdoor NFL games on Saturday and Sunday, Stephanie, are going to be absolutely brutal for the players, the fans, for everybody in, involved. And travel, of course, is going to be tough. Tough conditions all around the country. Rob, thank you so much. The founder of FTX, who lost billions from investors' accounts, made his first appearance in a New York federal court today. But tonight, he is out on a $250 million bond, possibly one of the large, largest ever. ABC's Aaron Kuturski has more. Tonight, the one-time crypto wonderkin Sam Bankman-Fried left court with an ankle bracelet and an order to go live with his mom and dad, a judge ordering him released on a $250 million bond, an amount he told ABC's George Stephanopoulos he couldn't now pay. I think I had $100,000 left in my bank account last I checked, and I, I think I have, you know, I uh, one credit card working with that right now. Bankman Freed was arrested last week in the Bahamas for perpetrating what prosecutors called a fraud of epic proportions. Today, he appeared in the same courthouse where Bernie Madoff once pleaded guilty. The clanging of shackles around his ankles audible in the room. He's now facing eight charges, including fraud and conspiracy, and he's not the only one. Before Bankman Freed even landed in New York, authorities announcing two of his key associates, his ex-girlfriend, Caroline Ellison, and the co-founder of FTX, Gary Wang, had agreed to testify against him, both pleading guilty to charges for playing what prosecutors called a significant role in the $8 billion fraud. Aaron Kuturski joins me now. Aaron, any hint about what happened to the billions of dollars Sam Bankman Freed allegedly stole? Not yet, Stephanie. Prosecutors still don't know what happened to that $8 billion that seems to have just vanished. But we did learn a little bit more in court today about Bankman Freed's own finances. A prosecutor pointed out that he once claimed assets that would have made him a billionaire. Now his bank account is sufficiently diminished. And before he left court, Bankman Freed was barred from doing any business worth more than $1,000. After what happened with the collapse of FTX, though, the judge pointed out that Bankman Freed has achieved sufficient notoriety that nobody wants to do business with him. Stephanie? A story that just keeps unraveling. Thank you so much, Aaron. There's a new alert from the CDC tonight warning parents of an invasive form of strep that is sickening children. This comes as the triple virus threat of the flu, COVID and RSV has overwhelmed hospitals. Ariel Reshef spoke with doctors about what to look out for ahead of the holiday weekend. Tonight, a new alert from the CDC urging doctors to look out for cases of that rare but dangerous form of invasive strep A in children. The infection on the rise in some places. Invasive strep A is incredibly rare, but when it does happen, the impacts can be devastating, including death. And that's why we have to be really cautious and to make sure that we identify potential infections and, and absolutely intervene as early as possible. And with Christmas just days away, health officials urging Americans to take the early and relentless spread of respiratory viruses seriously as hospitals across the country cope with a crush of patients. It's not just a COVID problem. We're, we're dealing with COVID, the flu, RSV, but also other respiratory issues that we get normally at this time of the year. And with COVID cases and hospitalizations spiking 40% since Thanksgiving, doctors concerned about an upswing after Christmas. Advising people to pack rapid tests and test before gathering, even if you don't have symptoms. Our thanks to Ariel for that report. Turning to Ukraine, 24 hours after delivering a historic address to a joint meeting of Congress and to the American public, Ukraine's President Zelensky is now back home. Zelensky appealed for billions in aid from the U.S. and received ovations from both parties while sending a defiant message to Vladimir Putin. Here's ABC's chief White House correspondent, Cecilia Vega. Tonight, President Vladimir Zelensky back in Ukraine after that high-stakes trip to Washington, stopping in Poland, <inaudible> saying he is coming home with good results. In his historic address to a joint meeting of Congress, the defiant Zelensky dressed in military fatigues, thanking Americans for their help while pleading for more. We have artillery. Yes. Thank you. We have it. 
Is it enough? Honestly, not really. <laughs> Zelensky handing Vice President Kamala Harris and Speaker Nancy Pelosi a Ukrainian flag signed by the very frontline soldiers he was just with hours earlier. We will win because we are united. Ukraine, America, and the entire free world. But Zelensky also delivering a sober warning about the tough road ahead, saying Russian strikes are hitting Ukrainian power supplies hard, his people now bracing for a harsh, potentially deadly holiday. In two days, we will celebrate Christmas. Maybe candle it. Not because it's more romantic, no, but because there will not be will be no electricity. Millions won't have neither heating nor running water. ABC's Britt Klenet seeing the darkness firsthand in Kyiv, where through the windows, teachers and students are seen studying by candlelight. There are just a few lights on in that residential building and it's only 6 p.m. And over here, a bank actually still in operation, but in complete darkness. These guys are putting in a new generator. Back in Washington today, Congress moving to approve $45 billion more in aid to Ukraine, though some Republicans say they're opposed to sending more assistance. More than half of all House Republicans refused to even show up for Zelensky's historic address, some who did sitting during standing ovations. The Senate today passed that massive spending bill, $1.7 trillion, and in it that includes a $45 billion for Ukraine. It heads to the House tomorrow and is expected to pass there, but with Republicans on the verge of taking control of the House, the question about Ukraine funding remains very much up in the air. The man who is expected to become the next Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy, says he does support Ukraine, but he does not support writing a blank check. We also now have, Stephanie, have a response from Russia, from the Kremlin, in response to Zelensky's visit to Washington. They called it a Hollywood-style trip. They say that will not advance peace talks, Stephanie. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Staying in Washington, where the January 6th committee is preparing to release its final report on the attack on the U.S. Capitol and the days leading up to it, newly released transcripts reveal how one of the panel's most compelling witnesses was allegedly pressured to not testify against former President Trump and his inner circle. Here's ABC's chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. The January 6th committee today released what it says is evidence people close to Donald Trump tried to intimidate one of its star witnesses. Cassidy Hutchinson's live testimony in June was explosive. The top aide to former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows delivered an eyewitness account of what was happening at the White House on January 6th. I overheard the president say something to the effect of, you know, I, I don't effing care that they have weapons. They're not here to hurt me. Hutchinson recently told the committee she was scared to testify, saying she told her mother, quote, they will ruin my life, mom, if I do anything they don't want me to do. She said her first lawyer, who had worked at the Trump White House and wouldn't tell her who was paying his bills, told her, quote, the less you remember, the better, and implied he could get her a job telling her, quote, the pay will be great. You're going to be financially very comfortable. And she told the committee that an aide to Meadows reached out to her before she testified, saying, quote, Mark wants me to let you know that he knows you're loyal and he knows you'll do the right thing tomorrow and that you're going to protect him and the boss. Our thanks to John Carl. President Biden delivered a Christmas address from the White House today. The president faces a Republican-controlled House in the new year, but he offered an optimistic look at what's ahead and focused on what unites the country. We've become too divided. But as tough as these times have been, if we look a little closer, we see bright spots all across the country. The strength, the determination, the resilience that's long defined America. We're surely making progress. President Biden and First Lady Dr. Jill Biden will be spending Christmas at the White House. When we come back, why hundreds of passengers had to rush to evacuate an iconic ferry right here in New York City. And 
moving to space. He is a key figure in the race for private space travel and the subject of a new docuseries. Sir Richard Branson tells us how it pulls back the curtain on his life, success, and his out-of-this-world adventure. But first, an American woman says her time in a Russian prison was marked by abuse and harsh conditions, and she doesn't feel the U.S. did enough to intervene. In her first network interview, she opens up about her imprisonment and fight for freedom. From history making to history shaking, high stakes, high drama. The year 2022 was... Oh, mind Insane. Oh my gosh. <laughs> How much time do we have? The breakout stars, the celebrity romance, the music, and... Wait, what? Oh my God, that was this year. Whoa. Great. Shut up! It's the year 2022. Monday night at 9 Central on ABC. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. Okay, it seems everywhere you turn, there is another wild con. And Friday night, we're serving up two juicy cons. Ooh, wild. First up. Not everybody has their pastor on the FBI's most wanted list. Hold up. What? How much did this man lose? $40 million was stolen. And imagine having a best friend who says they're royalty. But wait, there's a catch. Ah! What? No. If you think you would never, ever fall for a con, <laughs> don't be so sure. Friday night on 2020 at 9, 8 central on ABC. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show name? Special Agent Will Trent, Georgia Bureau Investigation. We'll see the things that no one else does. There's a kidnapping. Oh, I love some good old-fashioned detective work. He read that crime scene like it was a book. I bet I can solve this tonight. <laughs> you made a bet on this? So an opportunity to make a little cash. Why Will Trent? He's good police, and he's objectively hot. Plus, I'm a pretty observant guy. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. It's the type of place where you can walk home by yourself. It really is a perfect college town. The victim had been stabbed 19 times. Could have been any of us. Wow, it's wonderful to think that you can leave your doors unlocked. Don't. Death in the dorms, only on Hulu. Take a look at this video. This emergency, you, you see crews there rush to evacuate hundreds of passengers aboard the iconic Staten Island Ferry tonight after a fire broke out. Responders guided them through the dark and onto tugboats and other ferries right there in the water. Officials say the fire broke out in the engine room. The vessel was near the Statue of Liberty in New York's harbor on its way to Manhattan from Staten Island. Frightening moments there. An American woman was locked behind bars for nearly a year in Russia and now now, in her first national TV interview, Sarah Kravonik is talking about the ordeal from being entangled in the Russian legal system to harsh conditions at a penal colony where she says she was assaulted and to feelings of abandonment. Our Will Reeve has her story. After nearly a year in a Russian prison, Sarah Kravonik is back home in the U.S. and speaking out in her first network TV interview. What's on your bruschetta? Come back. The English teacher had been living in Russia since 2017. Last November, she was arrested for assaulting her roommate with a knife. She says he was abusing her, and she acted in self-defense. He comes busting through the door, busts the door down, breaks the TV, picks me up by my hair and throws me across the room and starts thumping on me. I'm completely covered in 
bruises like a raccoon across my eyes. The next month, after visiting the U.S. Embassy, a diplomatic official arranged for the 46-year-old to fly back to the U.S., but she was taken into custody at the Moscow airport prior to boarding. Kravonik says she thought she was free to go. At her trial in February, just weeks before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Kravonik was sentenced to 15 months in a penal colony. I just start, I start bawling. I'm just sobbing. I can't even speak. I can't speak in English. I can't speak in Russian. I'm just gibberish. Do you believe that your status as an American and the war in Ukraine had any bearing on your fate? Absolutely had 100% barren. If this situation would have happened at an earlier time or a different time in history, I wouldn't have been sentenced at all. And shortly after I was sentenced on the 11th of February, was detained another American in the airport on the 17th. I, Brittany Griner. Yeah, which, which is Miss Griner. So I believe that a person could easily say, of course, they used these two situations as an advantage. Um, for their political agenda. There's a stark contrast between the attention paid to WNBA star Brittany Griner's case and Kravonik's. Unlike Griner, the State Department never classified Kravonik as wrongfully detained. It feels like that my patriotism or my citizenship to my own country meant absolutely nothing. They might as well have just left me there. They completely throw out the fact that another human being, another American citizen, is also going through you know, her sufferings with no support. You said you were angry. Who are you angry at? I'm angry at our U.S. government. Why? For leaving me there behind a rot. They said, we are working on your case very diligently. Somebody's going to come out to see you in the colony. Nobody ever came. Kravonik served her time in a remote penal colony housing male and female inmates. She says she had no way to communicate with the outside world. She was desperate for anyone outside the prison to know where she was. I thought I could complain about the prison administration and the, the, the conditions of how I'm living to the right person. No, you cannot do that. And my punishment was soft compared to what they can do to you. So I took my punishment like a lamb to the slaughter. So you weren't being physically punished? No, not by the guards. By who? If I have no supplies, no food, no vitamins, no medicine, no phone calls. I make one complaint and I'm assaulted by a male inmate that was guarded by other female inmates and other inmates standing post. Then the psychological damage that comes from that is it's my fault. So I'm, I'm humiliated. All my privileges are taken away. I can't even go to the cafeteria. I can't use any of the food. I can't even go into the kitchen. I can't use any cutlery or dishes anymore. I had to go out and find my own spoon, cup, and bowl. After this punishment... I never complain again. How far away did freedom feel? Two and a half months. Forever. Forever. Eternity. Across the world in California, and unbeknownst to Kravonik, her longtime friend Anita Martinez had been working tirelessly to get answers. I wrote letters to the White House, to the State Department, to the embassy. I said, Sarah has absolutely nothing to bargain with. She's in there alone with absolutely nothing. All, my, all I'm asking is to just help me help my friend. That's it. What made you want to help Sarah so much? She has a good heart. I know Sarah. I just know her. It must be almost overwhelming to feel so loved and cared for like that. I, I have no words to express my appreciation, except that I give up prayers for her. And when I learned that Anita was fighting for me, any time that I could find a candle, I would light a candle for her and I would put my prayers up for her. In November, Kravonik was back in court and formally deported by the Russian government. At the same time, the U.S. government was negotiating a prisoner swap. Russian arms dealer Victor Boot, in exchange for Griner's release from a nine-year sentence for drug charges. On December 8th, both women left Russia. I'm really glad that she got out. I wrote her a letter from the deportation detention facility I was in, said, you know, don't worry, nobody's going to leave you behind or everybody's supporting you. Prison life is going to be very cruel. You're going to need to learn your opponent so you could survive. So I was genuinely, as a human being, worried, what is she going to do for nine years? I just felt sorry for her because I thought she did make a lot of mistakes and infractions that cost me. But then she got swapped. I literally, genuinely had joy that she doesn't have to endure that.
Now Kravonik is focusing on her physical and emotional recovery, still grappling with feeling forgotten by the U.S. government, which she says has not reached out to her since her return. What message do you have to the Biden administration and the American government? But that all American citizens should get the same level of service, no matter what the situation is. Don't forget about me and don't forget about the others. Our thanks to Will Reeve. In a statement, the State Department says it has no greater priority than the safety and security of U.S. citizens overseas and adds the U.S. Embassy in Moscow provided assistance on Kravonik's case for more than a year, including coordinating with Russian authorities to ensure her safe return home. Kravonik returned to the U.S. on the same day as Brittany Griner, as reported in that piece. Still ahead here on Prime, what's causing life expectancy in the U.S. to plummet to its lowest level? in more than 25 years. And as we celebrate the holidays, you ever feel like your mom's food just tastes better or your partner's food? You might not be wrong. We set out to discover why food made by your loved ones can seem better. And it's a tradition celebrated by millions of families, but do you know how it started? We take a closer look at Elf on a Shelf by the Numbers, but first, our tweet of the day, the Broncos remember Ronnie Hillman, a running back who was part of the Super Bowl winning team in 2015. Hillman died after battling a rare form of cancer. He was just 31 years old. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're making magic. Starting January 3rd, the rookie moves to Tuesdays, and they're teaming up with the feds for an action-packed crossover event. This suspect is extremely dangerous. The rookie crossover event starts Tuesday, January 3rd on ABC. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Paul. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the night. <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Shut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Net Geo Wild. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. If you have young children, it is likely you have an elf on the shelf somewhere in your home tonight. Here's a look at how the toy and its story has become a holiday tradition by the numbers. 2005, that is when Santa first dispatched his magical spies to sneak into our homes inside a children's book. In 2008, the elf won the year's best toy award and more accolades followed. And by 2011, the beady-eyed little scouts got their own animated special and a year later, they debuted in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. More than 14.5 million scout elves have been adopted and nearly 10 million more elf pets and elf mates have infiltrated homes around the world. 100 people work for the company. That's it, just 100. Supplying the North Pole with elves and elf friends. They've launched 28 new products just this year. If there is an elf in your home tonight, just remember he's listening. And he'll tell all when he reports back to Santa. 
And we still have a lot to get to here on Prime. The new message from Brittany Griner to her supporters, who she's urging them to write to. And there's a search for someone who wants to live in a lighthouse and get paid $140,000 a year. There is a catch, however. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. Name? Special Agent Will Trent, Georgia Bureau Investigation. Will see things that no one else does. There's a kidnapping. Oh, I love some good old-fashioned detective work. He read that crime scene like it was a book. I bet I can solve this tonight. <laughs> you made a bet on this? So an opportunity to make a little cash. Why Will Trent? He's good police, and he's objectively hot. Plus, I'm a pretty observant guy. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're making magic. So what went wrong? Everything. When you hear the name Ye or Kanye West, how do you guys react? Is Ye an anti-Semite? Nobody crawls into a barrel and shoots themselves in the head. That's a mob hit. I wanted a little cushion for the cushion. If you get queasy, close your eyes right now. Catch the holiday impact by Nightline Binge Block. Streaming on ABC News Live and stream anytime on Hulu. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. The National Weather Service calling it a once-in-a-generation storm. Visibility near zero in parts of the country as drivers hit the roads for the holidays. A multi-car pileup in Washington State. Numerous accidents caused by icy conditions in Wichita, Kansas, and whiteout conditions on Highway 71 in Nebraska. President Biden urging everyone to heed local weather warnings. It's not like a snow day, you know, when you're a kid. This is serious stuff. Parts of the country could see the coldest temperatures in more than 30 years. The storm also taking its toll on air travel. Weary passengers dealing with thousands of flight delays and cancellations. Brittany Griner posting a heartfelt message of gratitude to her followers on Instagram. The professional basketball star writing, thanks to the efforts of many, including you, I am home after nearly 10 months. You took time to show me you cared and I want to personally take the time to write to you and say that your effort matters. Your letters helped me to not lose hope during a time where I was full of regret and vulnerable in ways I could have never imagined. Thank you from the bottom of my heart because of you, I never lost hope. Griner now continuing on a crusade to help others, ending her message with a plea to support Paul Whelan. Two new studies from the CDC show life expectancy in the U.S. has dropped for the second year in a row. The drop mainly due to an increase in deaths from drug overdoses and COVID-19. Life expectancy is now 76.4 years, the lowest level since 1996. For men, it's dropped from 74.2 years to 73.5. Women, 79.9 to 79.3 from 2020 to 2021. 
A class action lawsuit filed against a Colorado hospital accuses a nurse of sexually assaulting patients. Christopher Lambros, formerly an intensive care nurse at St. Mary's Medical Center in Grand Junction, was arrested in October. The lawsuit claims Lambros would drug patients when he assaulted them and that four terabytes of photos and videos were recovered related to him drugging and engaging in sexual acts with victims. The suit was filed against the hospital and its parent companies and says the hospital was negligent in allowing Lambros to commit these acts. St. Mary's Medical Center said it immediately terminated Lambros after his arrest and that it is cooperating with law enforcement. The House passed a bill to posthumously honor Emmett Till and his mother Mamie Till Mobley with the Congressional Gold Medal, the highest civilian honor that Congress awards. Till was abducted and brutally murdered in 1955 after witnesses said she whistled at a white woman at a grocery store in Mississippi. His mother, who insisted on an open casket funeral for her son to show what happened to him, will be honored for her pioneering civil rights work. The bill passed the Senate in January and now heads to President Biden's desk. Once signed, the medal will be given to the National Museum of African American history and will be displayed near the casket that Till was buried in. For anyone who has ever dreamt of running a lighthouse, your opportunity might be waiting in the San Francisco Bay. The East Brother Light Station, built in the 19th century and now a historic landmark, is looking for two innkeepers to maintain the lighthouse and bed and breakfast. The job comes with picturesque views, room and board, and a nice payday, but in exchange, innkeepers will assume the roles of boat captain, gift shop attendant, tour guide, host, and will serve as chefs with high quality culinary experience to prepare breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In addition, one innkeeper must have a Coast Guard captain's license. The position lasts for two years, starting in April. Philanthropist and billionaire Sir Richard Branson is known for his high-stakes adventures, record label, airline, charitable work, and he is a key figure in the race for private space travel. With director Chris Smith, in the new HBO docuseries, Branson gives viewers an in-depth look into his life of adventure, world records, business success, and his latest venture into space. Let's take a look. I don't believe that Virgin could be what it is today if he hadn't have done the boat crossings and the balloon crossings. We're going to space. Risk-taking is a drug. A drug that started as a child and has continued in my life ever since. And look who is here with us, Sir Richard Branson and Chris Smith. Thank you so much for joining us. Richard, nice I second. want to start with you. The series follows your many adventures from taking your own company, Virgin Galactic, as the first fully crewed space tourism flight to setting multiple world records with transatlantic and transpacific crossing speed records, to name just a few. What drives your sense of adventure? Oh, it's a good question. I suspect it's my mother. Um, and I think Chris um, very much uh, found that out in, in the making of the film. Um, uh, it's a thirst to learn, um, uh, a desire not, not to say no, but to see what I'm capable of, um, and just to push myself to the limits. And I love a challenge. Our whole family love challenges. And um, and I have great difficulty saying no. So it's got me into some interesting situations. And I think the, the HBO documentary series uh, illustrates that, that, that rather well. You're certainly pushing the limits. Chris, turning to you, you were the executive producer of Netflix, Tiger King, and director of the Fire Festival documentary, also on Netflix. What set following Richard's journey apart from your other work? Well, I, don't, I think it's hard to find, you know, I think Richard broke the mold after, you know, with the life that he's led. And so I think it was, it was exciting to do something that um, felt inspiring you know to me it was very inspiring to spend time with Richard and sort of it definitely had that you know he, he, he you know if you look back at his history it's it's making the most of every day and I think just even in, in making the film and spending time with him in person we definitely uh took that lesson to heart so Richard with the first fully crewed tourism flight of Virgin Galactic last year what are the next steps for your company but also where do you see the future of private industry space travel going well, I was really fortunate to have been on, on that first flight. It was 17 years uh, hard work that got us to that, that day. 
and and obviously the final episode i think it illustrates uh all, all the ups and downs and 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 heartaches and uh and joy at the end of, of finally getting to space um as far as the future um uh you know next year which is fast approaching um we'll start being start to put the 800 people who signed up to go into space into space and um, and I believe they'll have the same incredible day that I had. It's an, what an amazing experience. Uh, it's incredible to be able to do that. Chris, in following the Virgin Galactic Project, how did you and your team prepare for any given scenario in, in documenting this historic journey? Well, you know, we followed Richard up leading up to the actual space flight, and so that was really our mission. But I think the thing that, that I took away from it you know, there was a lot of news coverage around the time of the space flight that I think was very reductive. And it was, and, and, and myself included, just from an ignorance of understanding the journey that the 17 years and what went into that with this team of incredible people that tried to, to, to make this happen. And obviously it's really, it, it'd be really neat to, to travel to space and have that experience. But in your opinion, why is there a need or is there a need to travel to space at all? Oh, space travel is just so important for Earth. Um, I mean, if you go all the way back to the moon landing, what we learned from the, from the moon landing has transformed the Earth in a positive way. And, um, and I think what Jeff Bezos um, and myself, Elon, are doing, we brought the, the cost of space travel down to a fraction of where it was, the environmental cost down to a fraction of where it was. And you can also just you know, give people the, the joy of being able to see this beautiful Earth um, themselves um, from space, and 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 that overview effect it means means a lot. A tremendous joy, Sir Richard Branson and Chris Smith. Thank you both so much for joining us. The finale of the four-part HBO documentary Branson airs tonight on HBO and HBO Max. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot. As we all get ready for the holidays, you may be making your loved ones some food in the kitchen, right? Well, there is a belief that food, like sandwiches, tastes much better when someone else makes it for you. We set out to see if that's really the case. Most of us have eaten something made by a friend or loved one and thought their food, no matter how complex or simple, was better. This is really good. Because we didn't make it ourselves, which begs the question, why is it that when someone makes us food, it tastes better? Beautiful. And is this theory consistent? What's going through your mind now? We put it to the test. We've got Tashi and Nan here. You two have not met before, right? We are strangers. Yeah. Strangers, just for the record. But you're going to make each other a sandwich. I'm really glad that you also went for the onion because the onion is really controversial. What do you normally keep in mind when you're making a sandwich for somebody else? I keep in mind love. I feel the love already. You feel the love, right? What are you thinking about as you make the sandwich? I actually don't make sandwiches very often. <laughs> so I am just trying to remember all of the pieces. What's going through your mind now as you listen to Nan? I feel fortunate to have this experience depending on the kindness of a stranger. She'll always remember me for this. Mm -hmm. I'll be her first sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> and both sandwiches look good. They both look great. It's time for you ladies to enjoy these sandwiches. This is for Nan. Okay. And for Tashi. Nan's first sandwich that she has made, and it happens to be for you. So. I feel so honored. What do you think, Tashi? I don't love mustard, but this works. Mm. I don't know if I'm just excited because Nan made me this sandwich. And you appreciate it so much. I she's do. Here. She took the time to she think did. she heard your she preferences. Did. I actually love this. I usually never go for the soft bread, but I actually really like this. Do you think it makes you have to be more open-minded when somebody else is crafting your meal? I think this has allowed me to be a little bit more open-minded. I don't really allow people to do things for me, so it feels very personal, and I appreciate that. It's like a gift, right? What we're talking about making food for somebody else, it's a gift. It's a gift of love, it's a gift of your time, it's a gift of nourishment and food. And that brings people happiness, like more so than spending money. 
I'm Nick Whitmer. He's my friend Christian Durant. We were friends through stand-up comedy. Now we're making sandwiches. <laughs> what are you going to start with here? Bread and then what is a Captain Crunch? <laughs> I'm going to do white bread because I feel like Whitmer likes white bread over multigrain for some reason. <laughs> Next, we're going to go with turkey. There's salmon here. If I wanted to punish you, I would do the salmon. <laughs> And I'm not like a mustard guy, but I know he is. I probably won't eat this sandwich because I've, I'm really <laughs> adverse to mustard. All right, I'm gonna try to make mustard work for you. I don't think you will, but we'll see. Can I wipe this off real quick? I guess it's all going to the same place, right? In my mouth? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna make a little uh, aioli here. You see? I'm like coming at this from like a third grade <laughs> cafeteria lady angle. I used to work at a sandwich place, but they never let me make sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna do turkey and pepper jacks. Wow. See, now I feel bad, because he's really taking his time and making this beautiful sandwich. I want sandwich. you to enjoy lunch. <laughs> <laughs> boom, boom. I'm making this for you, too, so. Yeah. You gotta like it. That's pretty solid, I gotta say. It looks Thanks. beautiful. I thought we were gonna do the wedding cake bite. <laughs> <laughs> Mustardy goodness. <laughs> now taste each other's. There you go. Let's see what this aioli is, all it's cracked up to be. Mmm. Beautiful. It's an amazing sandwich. You know what's weird? Is I wasn't expecting to like this. <laughs> but this is really good. <laughs> so this is like a seven, and this is like a six and a half. They're uh -huh. really, really close. Do you think anything about who made it factors in? It's the first thought I had when I bit into it, I was like, how is this this good? It's like, <laughs> you know? So I think that does have something to do with it. I had to try this demonstration out for myself with my husband, Emu. We're making a sandwich. Aww. When he makes the sandwiches, they always taste a little bit better. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the convenience. I just put your favorite things in it. Too. A lot of cheese. You're getting mayonnaise. Okay. You're getting lettuce. The capers, you see the capers? Wait, are you hinting at what you would want oh, in your sandwich? Is that it? OK, that's what you would like. That's good to know. When you're at this cutting board, it's thinking about Stephanie. You know what? Yeah. When I'm making a sandwich for myself, I'm just thinking about eating. Emily, what do you think it is about eating the sandwiches that he makes for me and, and feeling and thinking that they're so much better than the ones that I make, even though we are using the same ingredients? Well, I've been hearing that you do it with a lot of love, right? So when you are receiving that sandwich, you are feeling that love. And that's not something that we do for ourselves. Not with a sandwich, anyway. So I'm tasting the one that I made for you. It is good. Right? Mm -hmm. Right? It's tasty. All right. Mm -hmm. Want to try your sandwich? Mm -hmm. Mm. This is right up my alley. I'm taking this home. I'll see you in the sandwich there. <laughs> Emio, you were talking about how Stephanie likes your sandwiches because she doesn't have to put the effort into making the sandwich. It's just beautifully constructed, lovingly delivered, and that's part of why it tastes so good. The sandwich is definitely more enjoyable coming from Emio. The love is there, and you definitely feel it. I love you. <laughs> You're great. <laughs> I can't believe we did that piece. <laughs> that was so much fun. Uh, no matter where I work, I always manage to get my husband on TV somehow. It's pretty funny, but thanks to all of the participants there and our producers, uh, Malka and Cecily. Thank you so much for that. That was a lot of fun. Uh, and before we go tonight, it's not just a, we're not just ending on a sandwich story. Uh, tonight, the image of the day, Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, speaks during her final weekly news conference at the U.S. Capitol, a new speaker will be chosen in January. That is our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks for streaming with us. And coming up in the next hour, we're staying on top of a few things. Who is now investigating an incoming Republican congressman as questions are raised about his past? And the latest developments in the trial of hip hop star Tory Lanez, accused of shooting rapper Megan The Stallion. Bank robbery! Starting January 3rd, the rookie moves to Tuesdays, and they're teaming up with the feds for an action packed crossover event. This suspect is extremely dangerous. The Rookie Crossover event starts Tuesday, January 3rd on ABC. What are the secrets that most people don't know? Let me see your ID card. Wait, 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 wait. This is a world you will have to live in.
There's no going back. You never know what you're gonna get on this show. That's all I'm gonna tell you. Yes, Whoopi! Is this mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely, always. absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right, they don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter. And it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're making magic. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Thanks for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. An ABC News analysis of the pardons granted by former President Trump found an unusually high number that are now facing legal scrutiny. Of the 238 people who were pardoned or had their sentences commuted, at least 10 are under investigation, charged with a new crime, or already convicted. Legal experts say it's unprecedented. We have much more on this at abcnews.com. Jury deliberations began today in the trial of rapper Tory Lanez. He is charged with shooting and wounding hip-hop star Megan The Stallion. The rising star says he shot her in the back of the feet while shouting for her to dance. Lanez's attorneys say one of Stallion's friends fired the gun and that he tried to stop the shooting. And soccer legend Pella's health condition is worsening, according to his doctors and family. The 82-year-old icon is receiving treatment for cardiac and renal dysfunction stemming from the cancer he's been fighting for more than a year. It's being called the nightmare before Christmas, a dangerous storm that has 200 million Americans under winter weather alerts across 45 states. The misery index is climbing with thousands of flights already canceled today and tomorrow. Rob Marciano will have your full holiday forecast, but we begin our coverage with Mola Lange in Colorado. The timing couldn't be worse. The Arctic blasts march across the country just as millions are packing the nation's airports, creating a cascading travel nightmare right before Christmas. It's pretty crazy. It is indeed. Among the millions passing through TSA checkpoints today, yours truly. Currently hustling through San Francisco airport where some terminals are more crowded than others. The United Terminal this morning, an absolute zoo. Hoping to catch my flight to Denver. Denver-bound flights today have been among the most canceled and most delayed. Despite sitting on the tarmac for more than an hour, I was one of the lucky ones. Ellie Ross is stuck in Denver, trying to go from Billings to St. Louis, now stranded overnight. That's not bad enough. The airline lost her baggage. How has the process been to rebook and, and find a new flight? Right now, it's terrible. Why it's been awful, yeah. Um, haven't been able to talk to a real person. Um, long lines, waiting everywhere. From Boston to LaGuardia to Chicago's O'Hare, more than 2,000 flights canceled in and out of the U.S. today, and the day's not even over yet. And with the combination of airlines reducing flights and crushing holiday demand, flights are 95% full, making rebooking a challenge, if not impossible. Tired, stressed, hungry, just hopeless, honestly. Challenging for so many hours thanks to MOLA. The storm system is moving east with heavy rain and high winds and concerns that the frigid air behind could trigger a flash freeze. Below zero wind chills are forecasted from the plains to Texas into the northeast tomorrow. ABC's Alex Perez has the latest from Chicago. 
Tonight, that brewing bomb cyclone turning highways into white knuckle whiteouts for drivers. Outright blizzard conditions in the northern plains. This was the view from a trooper's cruiser in Cheyenne, Wyoming overnight. Officials nearly everywhere urging drivers to stay off the roads. The front moving into the Chicago area late this afternoon. Feels like it's 25. That's nothing compared to what's coming. Look what's coming. Overnight, powerful snow squalls forcing motorists to a standstill on Interstate 25 outside Wellington, Colorado. And more than 100 people rescued from Interstate 90 just outside Rapid City, South Dakota, taken to shelter to wait out the storm. A 200-mile stretch of that highway shut down till at least Friday. In Wichita, a glaze of ice turned highways into skating rinks. The bone-chilling cold stretching all the way to the deep south. In Houston, officials checking on the homeless. Our Elwin Lopez in Atlanta, where they're bracing for the coldest Christmas since 1985. The governor here declaring a state of emergency ahead of that Arctic front. Crews will be laying down two layers of brine before that rain moves in. The biggest concern, flash freezing and black ice. The president briefed on the storm by FEMA officials today. Please take this storm extremely seriously. Absolutely brutal conditions there. Alex Perez joins us now from Chicago. Alex, what are conditions there right now? Yes, yeah, Stephanie, the conditions have been deteriorating all day. We are bracing for temperatures that will feel like 30 below zero tonight. You can see city crews have been busy salting streets trying to get ahead of the icy conditions. This will be the coldest Christmas in Chicago since the year 2000. Stephanie? All right, Alex, thanks so much. Go ahead and stay warm. All right, let's get to the man everyone has been waiting to hear from tonight. Rob Marciano is tracking that all-important holiday forecast, and so many are wondering, Rob, if they will be able to make it to their holiday destination. Rob, what, what can you tell us? I mean, travel is going to be tough all the way around us, Stephanie. The le leading edge of this cold air is where that cyclone is, and it's going to bomb out, as we like to say. It's entering that rapid intensification stage right now, and that'll expand the wind field uh, to where the point where we've got wind alerts now extend over 1,000 miles from the center of this thing, and there you see it on the map. A lot more red on the map, too. North Dakota to all the way to upstate New York. We've got blizzard warnings and high wind warnings have now been posted for parts of the northeast. I don't think it's so much the amount of snow that's going to fall, but the fact that it's going to be blowing sideways and it's going to be blinding at times from St. Louis up to Chicago. Certainly Michigan, I think it's going to get hit very hard. And there you see D.C. up through Pennsylvania. We're going to look at very heavy rain here over the next several hours. Not only rain across the I-95 corridor, but we'll see coastal flooding on top of urban flooding and winds that could exceed 50 or 60 miles per hour on the warm and cold side of this. So that means some trees will come down. There'll be some power outages. And where it doesn't snow, namely in the Northeast, It'll flash freeze, meaning some of that rain that's left over on the roadways, the temperatures will drop so quickly, we'll see some icing uh, come Friday night into Saturday morning. Here are some of the numbers, and they are striking. This is bone chilling, <coughs> biting stuff. And in case, in some cases, like the, the South, like Dallas, this is a uh, pipe bursting stuff. So I hope your home is prepared for it. And uh, Louisville minus 27 tomorrow morning. This does spread towards the East Coast and envelop, envelop uh, everybody from the Maine all the way towards uh, Florida. And Saturday morning lows will be similar. Places like Nashville and Pittsburgh where they're hosting NFL games. On top of everything else, some of these outdoor NFL games on Saturday and Sunday, Stephanie, are going to be absolutely brutal for the players, the fans, for everybody in, involved. And travel, of course, is going to be tough. Tough conditions all around the country. Rob, thank you so much. Turning to Ukraine, 24 hours after delivering a historic address to a joint meeting of Congress and the American public, Ukraine's President Zelensky is now back home. Zelensky appealed for billions in aid from the U.S. and received ovations from both parties while sending a defiant message to Vladimir Putin. Here's ABC's chief White House correspondent, Cecilia Vega. Tonight, President Vladimir Zelensky back in Ukraine after that high-stakes trip to Washington, stopping in Poland, <laughs> saying he is coming home with good results. In his historic address to a joint meeting of Congress, the defiant Zelensky dressed in military fatigues, thanking Americans for their help while pleading for more. We have artillery. Yes. Thank you. We have it. Is it enough? Honestly, not really. 
Zelensky handing Vice President Kamala Harris and Speaker Nancy Pelosi a Ukrainian flag signed by the very frontline soldiers he was just with hours earlier. We will win because we are united. Ukraine, America, and the entire free world. But Zelensky also delivering a sober warning about the tough road ahead, saying Russian strikes are hitting Ukrainian power supplies hard, his people now bracing for a harsh, potentially deadly holiday. In two days, we will celebrate Christmas. Maybe candle it. Not because it's more romantic, no, but because there will not be will be no electricity. Millions won't have neither heating nor running water. ABC's Britt Klenet seeing the darkness firsthand in Kyiv, where through the windows, teachers and students are seen studying by candlelight. There are just a few lights on in that residential building and it's only 6 p.m. And over here, a bank actually still in operation, but in complete darkness. These guys are putting in a new generator. Back in Washington today, Congress moving to approve $45 billion more in aid to Ukraine, though some Republicans say they're opposed to sending more assistance. More than half of all House Republicans refused to even show up for Zelensky's historic address, some who did sitting during standing ovations. Our thanks to Cecilia. Now to the founder of FTX, who lost billions from an investor's accounts, made his first appearance in a New York federal court today. But tonight, he is out on a $250 million bond, possibly one of the largest ever. ABC's Aaron Katursky has more. Tonight, the one-time crypto wonderkin Sam Bankman-Fried left court with an ankle bracelet and an order to go live with his mom and dad, a judge ordering him released on a $250 million bond, an amount he told ABC's George Stephanopoulos he couldn't now pay. I think I had $100,000 left in my bank account last I checked, and I, I think I have, you know, I uh, one credit card working with that right now. Bankman Freed was arrested last week in the Bahamas for perpetrating what prosecutors called a fraud of epic proportions. Today, he appeared in the same courthouse where Bernie Madoff once pleaded guilty. The clanging of shackles around his ankles audible in the room. He's now facing eight charges, including fraud and conspiracy, and he's not the only one. Before Bankman Freed even landed in New York, authorities announcing two of his key associates, his ex-girlfriend, Caroline Ellison, and the co-founder of FTX, Gary Wang, had agreed to testify against him, both pleading guilty to charges for playing what prosecutors called a significant role in the $8 billion fraud. Our thanks to Aaron. Now to the incoming Republican congressman from New York, who is under fire before even taking office. The state attorney general is now looking into allegations George Santos lied about his past during his campaign. Everything from his education to his work on Wall Street to claims his grandparents survived the Holocaust. Congressional correspondent Rachel Scott reports. I appreciate you guys. Thank Tonight, the New York Attorney General is looking into explosive allegations surrounding incoming Congressman George Santos. I hope I can earn your support. After a New York Times investigation revealed the Long Island Republican may have misrepresented substantial parts of his resume and background. His family lived the American dream. He ran on the promise of the American dream, telling voters his grandparents survived the Holocaust and fled to Brazil. My grandparents survived the Holocaust, so these regimes of socialism, Marxism, they don't work. But The Forward, an independent Jewish organization, reviewed genealogy websites that show his grandparents were actually born in Brazil. Santos helped his party clinch a narrow majority in the House, making history as the first openly gay Republican to win a House seat as a non-incumbent, telling USA Today that he's never had an issue with his sexual identity in the past decade. But tonight, new revelations that Santos finalized his divorce with a woman less than two weeks before launching his first bid for Congress in 2020, something he has not talked about publicly. He also claimed to be a Wall Street financier and investor who worked at Goldman Sachs and Citigroup, graduating from Baruch College. But when we reached out to Baruch, Goldman Sachs and Citigroup, they all told us that name did not match their records. His lawyer calling it all a campaign to smear his good name. Tonight, Santos breaking his silence, saying that he is committed to delivering on the results that he campaigned on. He says he plans to speak out next week, insisting he has a story to tell, Stephanie.
Thank you for that report, Rachel. And still to come, why Nepal's Supreme Court has decided to release an infamous serial killer known as the Serpent. And as outrage grows in Afghanistan over the Taliban banning women from higher education, we speak with someone from the United Nations about the reasoning behind that policy and whether public pressure could reverse the decision. From history making to history shaking, high stakes, high drama. The year 2022 was mind blowing, insane. Oh my gosh! <laughs> How much time do we have? The breakout stars, the celebrity romance, the music, and wait, what? Oh my God, that was this year. Whoa! Right. Shut up! It's the year 2022. Monday night at 9 Central on ABC. Okay, it seems everywhere you turn, there is another wild con. And Friday night, we're serving up two juicy cons. Ooh, wild. First up... Not everybody has their pastor on the FBI's most wanted list. Hold up. What? How much did this man lose? $40 million was stolen. And imagine having a best friend who says they're royalty. But wait, there's a catch. Ah! What? No. If you think you would never, ever fall for a con... <laughs> Don't be so sure. Friday night on 2020 at 9, 8 central on ABC. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? Yes. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon. 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. It's the type of place where you can walk home by yourself. It really is a perfect college town. The victim had been stabbed 19 times. Could have been any of us. Wow, it's wonderful to think that you can leave your doors unlocked. Don't. Death in the dorms, only on Hulu. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Nepal's Supreme Court ordered the release and deportation of the French serial killer known as the Serpent. Police say he is responsible for murdering more than 20 young Western backpackers across Asia in the 1970s and 80s. His crimes were the focus of a BBC and Netflix TV series last year. He's being released due to his age. He is now 78. North Korea has sold weapons to a Russian military company called the Wagner Group. U.S. officials said this shipment is unlikely to tip balance in the war in Ukraine, but expressed concern that North Korea will continue to supply Russia's war effort. And in Afghanistan, the Taliban continued to enforce its ban on education for all, even for the youngest girls. This video showing a group of teenage girls being forced to leave a private girls' education center in northeastern Afghanistan. One of the girls said they were beaten. Another said the small center was their only hope, and now it is shuttered. That as outrage continues to grow over the Taliban's decision this week to ban women from attending universities. Several of the nation's top cricket players there have condemned the ban. And women took to the streets in Kabul today chanting, we are all together. We broke oppression, freedom and equality. In this cell phone video, one protester says security forces used violence to disperse the group and that female security officers beat and whipped some of the demonstrators. United Nations Women Deputy Executive Director Anita Bhatia joins me now. Thank you so much for speaking with us. How are sure. women in Afghanistan reacting to this ban, which went into effect immediately this week? I think women in Afghanistan are in a state of mourning and shock and horror at this latest oppression of their rights. Uh, UN Women, which is present on the ground in Kabul, speaks regularly to women's rights organizations. And what we hear from them is absolutely heartbreaking. This is a chilling heart back to the dark days of the 1990s. And women are terrified, upset, angry, devastated. 
as they should be. Since the end of the previous Taliban rule two decades ago, Afghan women have worked so hard to regain their freedoms and build their role in society. It seems as though this is all being torn away now. Is there a sense of desperation from the women that you're speaking with that are there? There is an absolute sense of de desperation and a sense that they are being erased from public life and public visibility. There have been a series of violations of women's rights since the Taliban came to power. None of the early promises of the Taliban to allow women to attend school, to participate in public life have been kept. In fact, repression of women's rights is getting worse, not better. Women aren't allowed in addition to not being able to go to school, now not being able to go to university, uh, they're not allowed to go to public parks, they're not allowed to go to gyms. So women really feel as if there is uh, no end in sight to the continuous oppression of their rights. It's as if the Taliban wake up every morning and say, well, what new way can we find to oppress women's rights? Their basic rights are being stripped away. What message is that sending to society there? Well, what it shows very clearly is that it's actions, not words that matter. And the actions of the Taliban are sending a message to society that girls and women do not matter and that they can be treated as chattel and that they can be treated in a way which is fundamentally disrespectful of their human rights. And this is something that cannot just be a women's issue. You know, young men have to speak up as well. And we have heard stories of young men in Afghanistan showing solidarity for their sisters, mothers, daughters, and walking out of universities in protest. But we need a mass movement of young men and uh, men in general speaking up about this because this is not just a women's rights issue. It is an issue for all of society. And that was my next question. Where does it, where do they, where can they get hope from? And is, is that where the hope lies in the men being able to stand up for these women? I mean, hope seems a very distant dream for women in Afghanistan today. I will tell you that. There are huge issues with mental health, depression, suicide rates are going up in places because they just don't see a way out. Remember that a lot of women in Afghanistan are very well educated well-trained, there are doctors, nurses, teachers, people in public service, and they are finding that their opportunities are being stripped away. They're finding that their daughters and sisters' opportunities are being stripped away. So this has tremendous impacts on their mental health as well. And the hope lies in voices of the international community speaking up, not forgetting Afghanistan. Every time there is an egregious violation of rights, like the one that has just happened, the international community wakes up. But we need to keep Afghanistan and Afghani women front and center all the time. So we need advocacy. We need to make sure that the international community's actions, humanitarian or otherwise, are always conducted with a gender lens. We need to make sure that any dialogue on any issues concerning Afghanistan has women at the table and that women are part of decision making. And we need to make sure that we keep advocating for the full spectrum of rights, rights to education, right to work, right to participate in public life. This, there is a range of human rights that have been violated in Afghanistan. All of those need to be restored. And finally, we need other countries, other countries where women uh, is, Islamic countries where women are allowed to go to university to speak up as well. We certainly hope the international community can do that and can step up for Afghan women. Thank you so much for your time, Anita Bhatia from the United Nations. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. And still to come, how a woman is bringing awareness to the epidemic of homelessness by providing essentials, food, and some much-needed compassion in this week's TikTok. The website, holy crap! A nightmare. It's what went wrong. Everything. When you hear the name Ye or Kanye West, how do you guys react? 
Is Ye an anti-Semite? Nobody crawls into a barrel and shoots themselves in the head. That's a mob hit. I wanted a little cushion for the cushion. If you get queasy, close your eyes right now. Catch the holiday impact by Nightline Binge Block. Streaming on ABC News Live and stream anytime on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. What are the secrets that most people don't know? Let me see your ID card. Wait, 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 wait. This is a world you will have to live in. There's no going back. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Paul. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Cut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Paul. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Net Geo Wild. We now turn to our weekly segment, TikTok, where we take a closer look at the story behind the sensation. According to the annual homeless assessment report, more than 500,000 people were experiencing homelessness on a single night in January of 2022. Homelessness continues to be a national crisis in the U.S. Activist Shirley Raines, known as Beauty to the Streets on TikTok, hopes to bring awareness to the epidemic of homelessness. Shirley, along with her team, help to cultivate a safe space for the unhoused people of Los Angeles. You see her there, uh, providing them with tents, sleeping bags, home-cooked meals, clothing, and beauty products. Take a look. Okay, get into it. This is me getting things together for Tuesday feed tomorrow, because duh, who's going to do it? I'm getting the honey buns and stuff together. And then um, we don't like to take a lot of trash out the skid row, so I'm dumping the popcorn in one big plastic bag and getting rid of all those little plastic bags. They come in. Then I had to go back in there, child, and lift all them sodas and load them in a the van. And then I was done. We ready for tomorrow. Shirley joins us now. Welcome. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Building Thank connections. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. What you're doing is absolutely amazing and so necessary and appreciated. Building connections and, and making strangers feel loved is your mission. Tell us how you started serving the homeless population there in Los Angeles. You know, unfortunately, I lost a child. And when I was in my younger years, and I was experiencing homelessness myself at that time, and a lot of guilt and fast forward, um, trying to deal with a lot of issues in my life, a lot of trauma led me to an organization called Polly's Project. And I started feeding the homeless with him, and they were more interested in my hair and my makeup and my earrings. And knowing what fashion and self feeling good had done for me, I started doing the services for the the uh, the community, you know, the trans community, LGBTQ community, and then the young teenagers started finding me. They started calling me the makeup lady. And I've kind of pivoted from that nonprofit and started doing our own thing. Of course, bringing food and things like that out there. But I definitely knew the feeling, the need to try to kind of escape and make believe by way of hair, makeup, big eyelashes, big earrings. And so we ended up bringing that to the street, took the social media, as you can see, and um, got a large following, got a lot of um, help, and here we are. And you're giving them that confidence, too, a boost to their confidence in, in a very difficult time for them, I'm sure. And you're, you're serving hundreds of people on a weekly basis. How are yes. you offering these resources? What type of help are you getting? to help them. We are fully funded by our social media uh, family. Thank goodness for Instagram, who's been holding us down forever. We've got TikTok family going strong, our Facebook. We're fully funded by social media. People believe in what we do. We've got, you know, people like NYX Cosmetics, Thrive, Sephora, who donate constantly to us and for us. And clearly, Beauty to the Streets is, is focusing on making these strangers feel beautiful in their skin, no matter what situation they're in. What has been their reaction? When you're out there, you're making them feel beautiful, you're giving them that confidence. What do they tell you? You know, they, they say it changes them, but I don't know if it's the makeup. I don't know if it's the hair color or the fact that someone's taken the time to mm. actually call them by their name, actually touch them, actually ask them how their day is going. I think it's half and half. The feeling of someone scrubbing your hair or just somebody wanting to be around you, um, that 
that is the thing I think that starts the feeling of them feeling good. I can see the change as soon as they get to the chair. And some of them don't even look in the mirror. Honestly, they walk away feeling good without even looking in the mirror because it wasn't about how they, what they look like. It's just about how they were treated and the respect that they feel. And they say, you know, this reminds me when I was little, or this reminds me when my grandma used to wash my hair. And it opens up a door to a conversation, bringing back some of those good memories in, the, in a maybe not so good situation. You're making them feel human again. What would you say is the stigma uh, or, or some of the misconceptions that you're currently debunking with, with, your, with your system here? That they did it to themselves, that they brought it upon themselves, they did something to cause homelessness, um, that they're lazy, um, that they're alcoholics and drug addicts. And though you may see those things on the street, you have to understand that alcohol and drugs are the coping me mechanism to homelessness and not the actual um, catalyst itself. And um, I, I would hope that people would have grace and mercy. We we're coming off of a pandemic where lots of people lost their job, and we can see how easy it is to, to go from having a lot to having nothing. For our viewers who are interested in making a difference through your organization, how can they help? They can visit our website, beautytothestreet.org, or any of our socials, Beauty to the Street, Beauty, the number two, streets with a Z on the end. And um, we have Patreon, PayPal, click the link, donate. We also have a way to mail in items. And yeah, or follow us and just share and support. Your work is so appreciated and your passion to educate others about that community is going a long way. Thank you, Shirley, for your time and for sharing with us Thanks. and for what you do. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. You can visit Beauty to the Streets with a Z for more information on how you can help. And that is our show for tonight. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Thanks so much for streaming with us.